I am dreading the outrageous amount of debates we are about to endure between now and the 2024 election. And this made me wonder, why does the United States subject itself to this circus every few years? China is China, 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 China is, is investing. Now. If you talk over everybody, please we lose time. Who started it? And for that matter, what makes debates so important? Are we stuck with them forever or have political shifts rendered them obsolete? I haven't heard a buzzer yet which means I've got time to learn more about the past and future of presidential debates. Debates can be traced all the way back to ancient Greece and India, but let's stick with US history for now. What struck me about US debates when I dug deeper was that they're both older and newer than we think. What do I mean by that? Well, this is what I found out about the first debates. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln famously held a series of seven debates with his Senate opponent, Stephen Douglas. And if you thought today's debates were tough to sit through, imagine listening to one person speak for an hour, their opponent respond for 90 minutes, and then the original speaker make their case again for another half hour. Oh, and it's outdoors, so you're standing with 10,000 other people struggling to listen without any kind of PA system. The battles in Lincoln-Douglas style, as it was called, have endured as a type of competitive scholastic debate, but their influence on the modern format is actually minimal. As time marched on, new forms of mass media emerged that promised to bring presidential campaigns directly into the voters' living rooms, first through their radios and later their television sets. In 1940, Republican Wendell Wilkie arguably became history's first debate me bro, bro when he challenged President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who turned him down and cruised through to the unprecedented third term. Eight years later, Republicans broadcast a debate over the radio during their primary election. And in 1956, Democrats held their own primary debate on TV. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A presidential campaign must not degenerate into a mere personal conflict, for candidates are only as important as the ideas they represent. Believe it or not, the first ever televised inter-party presidential debate between Democrats versus Republicans featured two women, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith, who faced off as surrogates for their respective party candidates. Democratic President Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the only woman to have served in both the House and Senate of the United States, Mrs. Margaret Chase Smith. But if you asked most people in the US, they'd probably tell you that the first real televised presidential debate was between Richard Nixon versus John F. Kennedy in 1960. Going into the debate, Nixon was actually leading in the polls, while the senator from Massachusetts faced doubts due to his young age, inexperience, and Catholic religion. On September 26, 1960, the two candidates met on the debate stage and changed politics forever. JFK, vibrant, tanned, and handsome, charmed viewers, and more importantly, the media with his appearance. Nixon, only a few years older than Kennedy, looked like a zombie in comparison. He refused makeup and allowed cameras to capture his sloppy stubble. He wore a light gray suit that rendered him a featureless blob on black and white TV sets. Nixon was underweight and dealing with a staph infection, plus he was sweating buckets. In short, Tricky Dick had a rough night, and voters noticed. Kennedy was trailing in the polls before the debate, but afterward, he gained the lead on Nixon and never looked back. After that, there were three more debates that are talked about far less. Many said that Nixon won all of them on the merits, but it doesn't matter. Even when it comes to matters of global importance like the US presidency, the Nixon-Kennedy debate proved that image is everything. The course of the world history is a series of what ifs, and Nixon beating Kennedy at the height of the Cold War is certainly a big one. Since we are not currently living in a nuclear wasteland, maybe it's for the best, but it just goes to show how much debates can actually matter. Let's learn about some of the US's most decisive debates. We never again funnel aid to the conscience of convicted drug dealers. Values begin at the top. Now you might think that after JFK versus Nixon made such a splash, debates would have become an essential aspect of election season, but there actually wouldn't be another one for 16 years. It wasn't until 1976 that the US presidential candidates stepped up to the podiums to slug it out again, this time between Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter and the incumbent Gerald Ford. The debate made a slight difference in the race, nudging Carter to victory, but four years later, he'd find himself up against a far more formidable opponent, California Governor Ronald Reagan. 
Now, Carter was a fairly unpopular president, but he was still ahead of Reagan by a few points in the polls. When they finally met on the debate stage, though, Reagan mopped the floor with him. Next Tuesday is election day. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls. You'll stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? And what would you expect? It was a major mismatch, a charismatic Hollywood actor up against a humble peanut farmer. Of course, it didn't hurt that Reagan's campaign had secretly acquired classified documents that Carter used for debate prep. But the writing was already on the wall. Especially after Reagan dismissed Carter's legitimate criticism at one point with the caddy. There you go again. Reagan would go on to win the 1980 election in a frankly embarrassing landslide. And after that, presidential debates, it seemed, were here to stay. In 1988, both major parties established the Commission on Presidential Debates, or CPD for short, a nonprofit corporation that sponsored and produced every debate since. It's not a governmental organization, and there are no laws that require debates to take place or dictate what the rules are. Candidates can simply refuse to participate. More on that later. But then they'd be turning down free advertising, huge fundraising opportunities, and the chance to invigorate a flailing campaign. Another important role of the CPD is to prevent third-party candidates from participating. Businessman H. Ross Perot made it to the debate stage alongside Democrat Bill Clinton and Republican incumbent George H.W. Bush. Perot's feisty performance likely earned him 19% on the popular vote in the 1992 election while Bush was criticized for checking his watch and looking bored, leading to his ultimate defeat. It was the first and last time a third-party candidate would take part in the debates. Beginning in 2000, the CPD established a controversial rule requiring candidates to show 15% support across five national polls, essentially gatekeeping the stage for the two traditional parties. The rule has been subject to protests and lawsuits over the years, but the rule still stands. As long as presidential debates are important, third parties will remain marginalized. Speaking of 2000, if you want to talk about consequential debates, look no further than Vice President Al Gore versus Texas Governor George W. Bush. Despite some flubs, Bush's campaign strategy of painting him as an everyman you'd like to have a beer with was a sharp contrast to the nerdy VP. Al Gore was heard sighing throughout the first debate, like an overachiever in the back of the class who couldn't wait for the teacher to call on him so he could talk about his box. If, if I could respond to that, Jim, uh, under my plan, I will put Medicare in an ironclad lockbox. I think we need to put Medicare and Social Security in a lockbox. The governor will not put Medicare in a lockbox. Saturday Night Live and other outlets mocked Gore relentlessly for his performances, portraying him as a droning, unfeeling robot in contrast to the sweet-talking Texan. We are almost out of time, so I will instead ask each candidate to sum up in a single word the best argument for his candidacy. Governor Bush? Strategery. Vice President Gore. Lockbox. <laughs> Polls taken in September 2000 showed Gore with a modest lead, but after the debates in October, the race tightened and never let up. Now, we all know there was a lot more going on in that election than just a simple debate performance. But can you imagine how the 21st century would have gone if Gore hadn't been perceived as a total drip? Without that one debate and the ensuing brutal SNL impressions by Daryl Hammond, there might have been a very different response to 9-11. There might have been no Iraq war, no global financial crisis, no rampant xenophobia, no rollback of civil liberties. Gore let out a huge sigh during the debate and it might have been the most costly sigh in history. But it's proof that debates can shape the future. Of course, the 2000s and 2010s provide plenty of memorable debate moments. Hillary Clinton wasn't the first woman candidate to participate in the process. That would be Geraldine Ferraro, who vied for VP in 1984. But even in our supposedly more enlightened era, Hillary faced relentless sexism from every angle. Former President Donald Trump's brazen bullying was bad enough, but long before that, her fellow Democrat Barack Obama's dismissive comment that Hillary was likable enough felt like a slap in the face to women everywhere. Obama wasn't the first black candidate to make it to this debate stage either. The Reverend Jesse Jackson beat him to it in 1984, but Obama was the first black candidate to win a party's primary. Obama's debate performances in 2008, 
helped usher in his historic victory. And in 2012, he was able to use his opponent's sexism to his advantage when Mitt Romney uttered his objectifying blinders full of women remark that helped sink the Republicans' campaign. I went to a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. Which brings us to the fiasco that is 2016. Honestly, I'm not gonna devote a ton of time to this because that's kind of how Donald Trump got elected in the first place. The debates were always a little rowdy. That's the appeal. But the former reality star turned them into a full-fledged circus, filled with rude insults, childish nicknames, loud interruptions, and lies upon lies upon lies. Audiences and the media ate it up. Endless replays and commentary helped legitimize his farcical candidacy, allowed Trump to steamroll a field of 16 primary opponents, and enabled his shocking victory that has placed us squarely in the darkest timeline in this universe. The 2020 debates might have been even worse. The chaotic first debate saw both sides wind up working the refs and complaining about biased moderators, as well as constant interruptions. The second one was straight up canceled after Trump was diagnosed with COVID, and the third debate ended up with each candidate having their mics muted after they spoke. An unprecedented yet embarrassing necessity. In the fallout of Trump's decisive election loss, Republicans predictively threw a tantrum. In 2022, the Republican National Committee moved to prohibit future GOP nominees from participating in debates sponsored by the commission, essentially ending the CPD's 30-year reign. Yet another long-standing norm shattered in a time when no traditions are safe. This year, Trump, the likely nominee, has decided to sit out the Republican primary debates. In the past, this might have been seen as a candidate being cowardly and avoiding confrontation, but his poll numbers are as strong as ever. So that makes me wonder, what value do debates have in our era of polarization, one in which everyone has already chosen a side? If demagogues with pre-existing popularity can just no-show, why bother having them? Interest in debates has been steadily declining, and without the must-see allure of the most important candidates, will they still be worth holding if no one pays attention? The debates as we know them might be done for, but there's still a need for a robust contest of ideas and values. I see a future where the format evolves into something that actually focuses on the issues and information that matter to people. But I also see a future where candidates just post sick burns on social media. It's a new age for politics in a media landscape that's rapidly changing. And with more competition for our attention than ever, corny old debates just don't cut it anymore.